Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this seminar, which is the first of five classes on the subject of the hope of Israel. And what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at, well, first of all, where would we get this phrase from, the hope of Israel? And out of that, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to us as being mostly non-Israelites, as being um, Christians? What does it mean to us? And, and why should it even matter? And in particular, this evening, we'll be looking at the question of, well, why Israel? Why is it the hope of Israel versus any other hope? Well, let's have a look at Acts chapter 28, which is where we have the inspiration for the seminar's title, the subject of our next five weeks. And when we look in Acts 28, we see that Paul, when he's talking to other Jews, he says that it's for the hope of Israel that he is bound with this chain. And when we actually start and get the whole section, he says that it's for this cause. For this cause I have called for you to see you and to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, Well, we didn't receive letters out of Judah concerning you, nor any brethren came and showed or spake any harm. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that it is everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, and persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening. So he's testifying to them, of the kingdom of God and persuading them concerning Jesus. And that is the hope of Israel that he was talking to them about. That's the hope of Israel that bound him. And it's the gospel message. The gospel is described elsewhere as the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle Paul, he ties the gospel message to this hope of Israel. So why is it the hope of Israel? Why is it not described in the Bible as mankind's hope or the hope of the believer? Well, it is tied to those things. It is tied to belief. It is tied to mankind's salvation. But it is ultimately Israel's hope. Why is it Israel's hope? When we look at the world today, why is there so much importance placed on this tiny little country, this tiny minuscule part of the entire world why is that so important to God? Why does he highlight this little country as being uh, important? After all, out of all the countries that have been formed, uh, particularly since World War II, it is just one of many. Many countries have formed over the course of the last hundred years. Some of them have formed as bigger empires, such as the British Empire fell apart. Others, such as South Sudan, formed quite recently. What makes Israel any different than any of those? And why is it that for all of its, perhaps, a small part of the world, why is it always in the news? That's the other question that we need to ask, is why is Israel always in the news? And really, it's considered the ultimate problem to solve. People consider this problem of Israel and Israel's focus and position in the world as something to be solved. There's a problem to be solved here, and people spend the effort to solve it. And yet, what we're going to discuss tonight and what we'll be discussing over the course of the following weeks is that God has a plan for Israel. He always had a plan for Israel and that hope, that hope of Israel, is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Well first let's bring ourselves to a, a brief history of Israel. We can actually go back uh, to the history of modern Israel. We'll go back a hundred years and in fact it was about this time, a hundred years ago, that in England, Lord Balfour declared that the Jews, a homeland, should be given to them. So it's called the Balfour Declaration, and it was signed declaring that there's this homeland to be of the Jews that was required. Well, World War I came uh, and ended. World War II came and ended, and during World War II, there was the Holocaust in which six million Jews lost their lives. In 1948, just shortly after World War II ended, uh, or as it was ending, the state of Israel was born. Um, in 1948, really just shortly after the United Nations was born, one of the first things that happened within the United Nations was the birth of the state of Israel. In 
We have in 1967, one of the more significant events in Israel's military history was the Six Day War. About 50 years ago, uh, Jerusalem was taken back. Jerusalem had been in the hands of other countries. It had kind of set up as a special city. Um, and during the Six Day War, Israel, against all odds, against several nations coming up against them, they not only drove back the enemy, but they retook the city of Jerusalem. In 1993, we have one of several um, peace accords that were attempted, and the Oslo Accords were one of the particularly famous and critical important ones in the modern times, uh, where we have the famous picture of Bill Clinton standing with Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel. More, in, in more recent history, in 2005, Israel unilaterally withdrew from the Gaza Strip. After all the attempts at different agreements and different arrangements, Israel decided that they were going to have no more part in the Gaza Strip, and they abandoned it. They left all the settlements, everything they had there, they withdrew entirely. And then, more recently again, just this year, we have Israel um, participating in airstrikes in Syria. They are actively against Hezbollah in Syria. And so, during the midst of the Syrian civil war, we have Israel kind of dipping their toes into it, sending their warplanes in, trying to establish themselves as one of the powers in control. And while they're doing that, they are also celebrating this 100-year anniversary of the Balfour Declaration signed, and the official date will be November 2nd. So that's the brief history of modern Israel. But to really appreciate why this modern Israel is so important in global affairs today, well, we actually have to go back. We have to go far back, and we have to go back in our Bibles. Now, we could tie the start of the nation of Israel to a few passages, but the one I would like you to have a look at, uh, the one that perhaps spells it out most clearly, is from Genesis chapter 12. So we have a look at Genesis 12 and the first three verses. The Lord speaks unto Abram. Abram was found in Ur of Chaldea, modern-day Iraq. And the Lord said to Abram at that time, Well, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now we can really call this, again, the, the very start not only of the nation of Israel, but it's also one of the foundations of the gospel. Elsewhere in scripture, the gospel is described as the hope of the promises made by God to the fathers. And here we have the first, one of the first of the fathers, receiving a promise from God, a hope that was given to him, talking about a kingdom, and ultimately it would have to do with a kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this promise separated out the family of Abram, and while Israel came and went as a nation, in fact they've come and gone as a nation not once but twice, Scripture tells us that this is a promise that has not yet been fulfilled to Israel. It has not been fulfilled in its simple and clear and straightforward meaning, in which Abram himself would be a possessor of this land. Scripture tells us that he actually did not receive the promises. He did not receive what God had promised to him in the way that God had described it. And so, in that meantime, while God is waiting to fulfill that promise to Abram, Israel becomes God's witnesses. So the nation starts with a promise, a promise that forms the hope of the promises, the hope of Israel. And in the meantime, in the time that Israel has both come and gone, Israel has been a witness to God. Now we see that in Deuteronomy 7, God describes them as being a holy people to the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you for, to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. And it says, He did not set his love on you or choose you because you are more in number, for you are the least of all people, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. So he said that he was going to make them a special treasure, a special witness, and it's because he was intended to keep the oath that he made to Abram. 
Elsewhere in Isaiah 43 and verse 10, he describes really quite plainly. He says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. So the first thing that we gather from this verse, from Isaiah 43, is that Israel is to be a witness of God's existence, that he is God, that there's no other God formed, and that there's no other God after. He is the only God, and Israel is to be a witness of that. But how? How is Israel to be a witness that God exists and that he is the only God in existence? Well, Isaiah 43 actually goes on to say, he declares a, a few things. In Isaiah 43, and starting at verse 12, God goes into a little more detail about what he means by Israel being their wit- be, sorry, Israel being his witnesses. So we read that in Isaiah 43 and verse 10. Um, he says that you are my witnesses. And he goes on to say in verse 11 that I, even I am the Lord, Beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved. And I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who will reverse it? So he highlights three things. Three things that we're going to try and look at in just a little bit more detail. First of all, God declares that he is saved. He has declared and saved, and he has proclaimed that salvation. And so we can distill that down to the fact that God preserves his people. When he has chosen his people, he is going to preserve them. He has declared it. He has declared that he is going to save them. He has also declared in verse 13 that there's nobody who can deliver out of his hand. So really what that's telling us is that there's no changing of God's plan. Nobody can stop God from doing a work. And in fact, the way that we can describe it is that history, the times that we live in, the things that we see, history is actually being poured into the mold of God's plan. God set a plan, and nobody can deliver themselves out of it. Their lives and all of history is being declared and poured according to God's plan. Just like when you're baking a cake or something like jello, you might make a mold, and you pour that jello into the mold And when it sets, that is it. It it conforms to the mold. And so history is conforming to God's word. It's conforming to God's plan and not the other way around. It's not a case of we see history and we try and fit God's plan to that. It's the other way around. History is being conformed to God's plan. And finally, as well in verse 13, God declares that when he works, nobody can reverse it. So it's almost an emphasis on this fact that there's no changing of God's plan. There's no shortcuts. There's no preventing it from happening. So we can't exclude ourselves from it, and we can't shortcut it or prevent it. It's going to happen exactly the way that he described it. So let's have a look at at how this works. How is it that Israel is preserved? How is it that we see history being fulfilled? How is it that we can uh, identify that there's no shortcuts to God's timeline? When we look at the subject of preservation, we read in Isaiah chapter 1 that unless the Lord of hosts had left us a small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been made like Gomorrah. So God God has determined to preserve a remnant of his people. And that remnant has existed throughout history. In fact, a famous Russian author, uh, one of the classics, Leo Tolstoy, highlighted Well, what is a Jew? What kind of unique creature is this, whom all the rulers of all the nations of the world have disgraced and crushed and expelled and destroyed, persecuted, burned and drowned, and who, despite their anger and their fury, continues to live and to flourish? The Jews as a people are described as being persecuted to the ends of the earth. People have tried to destroy them several times over. And yet for all of the attempts to exclude them, to push them out of lands, to destroy them as a nation, they continue to live, and not only live, but preserve their culture, preserve their identity throughout the world. Something that really no other nation can 
can declare. There's no other country that can say that. Nobody can say of the Assyrians from many, many years back, generations that they can identify as a modern day Assyrian or a modern day Persian. The Iranians can kind of identify as modern day Persians and yet they can't do it as strongly as Israel can. Israel's history and Israel's culture can be positively identified for many thousands of years. So we just look at their history. We have to go uh, quite a ways back, but when we just go back to Bible times, we can go back to 740 BC where the Assyrians invaded and captured the northern uh, part of Israel and sent all those Jews to various parts of the Assyrian Empire. Shortly after, Babylon came in 586 BC and took the southern parts of Israel. And again, the nation was destroyed, the nation was absorbed into the Babylonian Empire, and if we can read from the story of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 1, is that there was a hard attempt made to absorb the Jews into Babylonian culture. The Persians were slightly more receptive to the Jews. It was one of the initial kings of Persia, Cyrus, allowed the Jews to go and rebuild their temple. But in 475 BC, approximately, is in the story of Esther, the attempt to completely annihilate the Jews as a people by the hand of Haman. So the Persian Empire, there was an attempt to completely destroy the Jews at that time. The Romans, the Roman Empire, starting perhaps first at AD 70, but even a bit before then, before AD 70, during the time of Jesus, is that the Romans did not have any positive feelings toward the Jews who would not adopt Roman culture and Roman customs. But in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews were scattered from Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout the Roman Empire and they were left to fend for themselves. They were, they were persecuted all throughout the Roman Empire um, right through the rest of the history of the Roman Empire. The Jews were blamed for just about everything. Moving a little forward in time, back to the Middle Ages. Well, during the Middle Ages, in various parts of Europe, the Jews were scattered all throughout Europe, and yet because there was this feeling that the Jews were not, were not permitted, they were, because they were not Christians, and they did not adopt the Christian cultures that were developing during the Middle Ages, is that they were tempted to be barred. They were not permitted to marry, particularly Christians. They were prohibited from government positions and appearing in courts. So if a man did a wrong to a Jew, well, that Jew would not be able to go to the court to have anything made right. That Jew is prohibited from appearing in the court. And ultimately, there was the spread, the start of the myth, that Jews would kill Christians for their sacrifices. That myth was started, and that myth spread throughout uh, Europe during the Middle Ages and led to Jews being persecuted and isolated everywhere. That myth pervaded all the way uh, right until or right through, really, 1545, where even Martin Luther, the beginning of the Reformation, and in fact, we're coming to one of the anniversaries of the Reformation uh, during this time as well, is that they claimed, that, and he claimed, that the Jews had a thirst for Christian blood, and he encouraged the slaying of all the Jews. And this was near the end of his life. Near the end of his life, he was so frustrated by the inability of the Jews to convert to Christianity, that eventually felt that this was going to be the only solution for them. Well, that continued right through Nazi Germany. Adolf Hitler also returned to that same myth, believing that the Jews slew Christians for their blood. And as a result, he was able to make an institution of genocide that resulted in the death of six million Jews. Now, 1945 is fairly modern history, but even, we can go even further modern history still to 2001, where during the 9-11 terrorist attacks, Al-Qaeda made a claim that it was American support for Israel that was part of their motivation to attack the World Trade Center in New York. And not just that, but the fact that New York was one of the highest populations of Jews outside um, of Israel. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, that's in New York, that's in Israel, that's in Europe. Surely Jewish persecution is done. I mean, you know, it can't really be a thing in, around here. And yet, in 2006, in the Jewish Federation building in Seattle, there was a shooting. And one of the reasons was that, well, they were Jews, and so a man walked in and attacked them. 
And we haven't really even talked about the fact that within the United Nations, hundreds, hundreds of anti-Israel uh, resolutions are brought forward and passed condemning various actions of Israel every single year, really. So Israel is still, uh, in this modern age, persecuted regularly. They're isolated and called out for various things that they do because, because they're unique, because they don't really adopt the system of the world around them. Yet we might wonder, well, maybe it's justified. And indeed, if we really ask ourselves, well, is this persecution justified? Well, the answer is, quite simply, yes, it is justified. If we have a look at Leviticus 26, God declares what would happen if they would not walk according to God's will. He would say in Leviticus 26, starting at verse 27, that after all this, after all the other things that he would do to them to try to turn them back, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And he goes on to say that I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. So God declared that if they did not walk according to his will, and they have not, in fact, Israel history is full of Israel not uh, doing according to God's will, not doing the things that make God happy. And he said that he would persecute them. He would send a sword after them. He would cast them out of their land. And yet for all this, for all this justification, it's Jesus who said that salvation is of the Jews. In John 4 and verse 22, ultimately even Jesus himself declared that for all that persecution, salvation is of the Jews. And part of that witness, part of that preservation, is the fact that they are persecuted, but they are not destroyed. In Jeremiah 30, we read that I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice. I will not let you go altogether unpunished. So God is punishing them, God is casting them out, but he is working to save them. And he's going to correct them in justice. Amos chapter 9 also repeats the same thing. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. And that's Israel. It was a sinful kingdom, and God intended to destroy it. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord, for surely I will command, and I will sift the house of Jake Israel among the nations, as grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. And that's the process that can be described as today. They're going through that persecution. They're going through that sifting among the nations. Yet God fully intends to preserve his people to the end, to fulfill that hope that he's given to Israel. We've looked at Israel being preserved. We've seen that God has preserved them throughout history. And indeed, they become witnesses to God's existence because for all of the attempts to persecute and destroy them and eliminate them from the face of the earth, they are still preserved. They still exist as a nation. And history and the fulfillment of that history has not been according to any of man's will. In fact, if it was man's will, there would be no Israel. But it's being conforming to God's will. God formed the mold for history in setting out his plan within the words of the Bible, and history has fulfilled it. So let's turn over to Ezekiel 37. We're going to pull out one set of verses from it, but we should have a good summary. We should look through the pages and see just what, what God envisioned and what he prophesied for the people of Israel. So Ezekiel 37, if we're going to have a look through uh, what happens is that God carries Ezekiel into a valley and he sees a valley and it is full of very dry bones, completely and utterly lifeless. And he's told to go prophesy upon those bones. He's told in verse 5 
Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And so Ezekiel prophesies, he says that, and he watches. All the bones come together. He finds each bone forms the full skeleton. The flesh and the sinews come up in verse 8. And they end up standing, described as a very great army. And yet it says that there's no breath in them. And it's a good description. Is that the breath only comes later. Is that the nation is brought together, but they still have to wait a period of time before they have breath in them. And it's describing really the, the course of Israel's history, is that they would come back to the land, and yet they would be missing something. They would be missing the breath. They would be missing God's spirit. They'd be missing God's power, God's mind in them. And it's true that the modern Israel is largely secular. They have Jewish culture. They have part of them being Orthodox Jews, but for the most part, Israel is a secular nation. They don't really trust or believe in God. In fact, many Jews, it was after the Holocaust that many Jews did not believe that God really existed for all the suffering that they endured. And these things have been predicted long ago. One such individual pointed out that in 1849, so a hundred years before there ever was a state of Israel, is that there was this expectation of people back in 1849 of a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation of Christ, which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes as he appeared in the kingdom. It says that that pre-adventual colonization will be on political principles. The Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the messiahship of Jesus and the truth in him. They will emigrate as agriculturalists and traders, and indeed they did. They were largely known for, they turned, literally turned the deserts into fields um, and, and brought great amounts of, of produce and, and vegetation out of what would really be a dead land. The land of Israel, when the Jews returned, was dead. And yet these things were predicted and expected, drawn from the word of God, um, that, that this would happen. And in fact, they went on to say that this would be really that the British power would be a large part of this. So in 1849 and other times, other people, many people believed that Israel would be restored, not as believing, but this unbelieving Jew uh, coming and restoring the land, bringing forth a great profit and produce from it. And yet we see that that Israel is not the Israel that ultimately will be, right? The breath, the breath of God's spirit has to become a part of the people of Israel. And that expectation, that expectation of a future operation to restore the kingdom to Israel is described for us in Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So he's going to make a new covenant with the people of Israel. He's going to put his law in their minds. It's going to be in their hearts. That's certainly not the state of Israel today, but ultimately he is going to forgive them, and he's going to make a new covenant with them. And that's a unique saying, isn't it? A new covenant. That is the gospel, the new covenant, the new testament that God was going to make with his people. And he allowed, really Gentiles, to partake of it first. But he still ultimately is planning to fulfill it in the people of Israel. So that restoration of Israel, a couple more verses just to really speak of the fact that he fully intends to restore his people in 2 Samuel 7, as a promise given to his servant David, he said that I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more 
so shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. So we looked at the promise to Abraham. Abraham was told to get out of your country and that you would be established in a land. And David was also told the same thing, that there would be this place appointed for Israel in which they would not move anymore. And so that is still being fulfilled. It's still a process that is at work, that God is going to bring his people into that place. Ezekiel 36, um, starting at verse 22, God says, Thus says the Lord God, I do, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. So God is working to do that. He is working to bring his people into his land, not for their sakes, not because they have done anything, but for his name's sake, for his purpose that he is working. And so that's the expectation. That is history yet to be fulfilled. And yet we can see what has been fulfilled has been according to God's outline. God's plan for history is being fulfilled and it will be fulfilled in the future. But what we might notice is that, well, in the meantime, Israel is in the news on an almost daily basis because everybody wants peace in the Middle East. And yet, there can be no shortcuts. God said that when I have made a plan, you will not make a shortcut of it. You cannot stop it. You cannot do things different than what God has already planned. And so what we can consider just in this last point is the fact that every peace initiative has failed. Every attempt to bring peace to the Middle East has failed, and the reason for it is that it is not according to God's plans. But it has not been for lack of effort. In 1949, right after the nation of Israel was born, every nation around Israel went to war, and Israel ultimately prevailed, and it ended with an armistice, an armistice to kind of stop hostilities for that time. And they thought that perhaps they would be able to um, restore some sort of peace again. Well, that armistice ultimately failed in 1967 during the Six Day War. The Arabs, once again, the nations around Israel took up arms and attempted to destroy the nation of Israel, and that failed. In 1978, Nations gathered to Camp David, and they came up with the Camp David Accords. And that was between, largely between Israel and Egypt, and those accords ultimately led to the Israel-Egypt Peace Treaty. So Israel and Egypt finally had peace, um, and yet, oddly enough, barely two years later, the, the main driver, one of the main uh, people who, who made that peace happen, um, the Egyptian president Anwar el-Sadat, well, he was assassinated in 1981 because he made peace with Israel. And so that peace now, while it still exists, is very fragile um, in these days. In 1991, going forward a little bit of history, there was the Madrid conferences. And so they gathered to Madrid and they attempted to, again, find a way to have peace in Israel. One of the interesting things about the Madrid conferences is that this was really the first time in which the USSR, or Russia as it would be known today, was involved. They began to kind of put their self and tried to get a piece of the pie, if you will, to try and be a participant in Middle Eastern peace. And ultimately those failed. Uh, ultimately kind of then moved into the Oslo Accords where Israel was trying to get kind of peace with different countries. But um, in that time period, in the Oslo Accords, ultimately kind of what came out of it was the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty. So Israel finally gained peace with another one of its neighbors. But very shortly after that, in 1995, the Israeli Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, was assassinated. So again, as soon as these peace agreements seem to kind of gather together, there's an assassination, and now that peace is also, it's a fragile peace that's held between Israel and Jordan. In the year 2000, they had the Camp David summits, and during the Camp David summit, 
uh, Israel basically offered a great deal of what uh, was demanded uh, by the Palestinian Liberation Organization, uh, except Jerusalem. And because Israel would not give up Jerusalem, is that though that peace agreement, that, that anticipated peace in which the entire West Bank would have basically been given over to the Palestinians, it ultimately fell apart. And finally, one of the last uh, more modern attempts, which is still perhaps a little bit ongoing, in 2002 there was declared a road map for peace. And the United States, Russia, the European Union, and the United Nations came together, they called themselves a quartet, and they declared that they were going to create this road map for peace to finally bring a separate Israel and a separate Palestine which would coexist peacefully together. And it has been 15 years since they attempted this roadmap and they have gotten absolutely nowhere. But during that time, Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip entirely in 2005, hoping perhaps to kickstart this. If, if they wanted to have a separate Palestine, then they pulled out entirely. And as history would have it, in 2006, barely one year after Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip, the popular Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon ended up having a massive stroke. He was taken out of the story altogether and he was left in a coma ultimately until his death in 2014. So in all of these attempts to bring the parties of the Middle East together to create this peace, it has always failed. There has always been something else that comes that interferes with it and it has not come yet. And the reason is that it's not according to God's principles. It's not according to the peace that God wants to have with his, with his people. It's not according to that new covenant which he's going to make with his people, and it's not according to his righteousness. Elsewhere in scripture it says that before there can be any peace, there must be righteousness. So it, every modern attempt at peace is lacking all those things. It simply is not going to happen. Ultimately, what Israel needs is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just a couple of passages to demonstrate that. In Zechariah 12 and verse 10, God says that at the end, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they shall look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves as one grieves for a firstborn. Israel needs the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. In Deuteronomy 18, God describes it in, in much fewer words. He says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like unto me, like unto Moses, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. So God's declaration through, the, through Moses was that there was going to be another prophet, and ultimately, they would hear him. The Jews did not hear Jesus the first time he came, but they will. Ultimately, they will hear him. So let's summarize what we've talked about over the course of this class. We've looked at Israel's history as a demonstration of God's existence and his dominion. We've looked at the fact that they continue to survive in a world that is opposed to them. So they continue to survive in a world that's full of opposition. They're opposed on every side, and yet they continue to survive, they continue to prosper. History has ultimately conformed to God's plan for Israel's development. It has not been any other form of plan. God's plan is the plan that has determined Israel's development in history uh, through the modern times. And ultimately what we see is that there can be no peace to Israel while Jesus Christ remains away. That is the ultimate fulfillment of Israel's hope, and we'll look at that in the last class, is what will happen when Jesus Christ comes that will bring peace to Israel. We see that Israel's future really depends on the fulfillment of a promise made at the very start of the nation. We went back to Abraham, and we saw Abram called out of Babylon, called out of Ur of the Chaldees, and was told that he was going to be brought to a land and we still wait for that promise to be fulfilled. It is the hope of Israel, the hope of God made to the fathers. And the fulfillment of those promises depends on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. There can be no other 
way to fulfill and bring that peace uh, in the land of Israel that we look for today. So over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the promises to Israel. We're going to look at their future and look at how important the Lord Jesus Christ is um, to the fulfillment of those promises. And in particular, next class, we're going to look at the promises that were made to Israel. Promises about the people, about the land, and about how they would be governed. And then we will continue on through our further study. So we want to thank you very much for joining us this evening and participating with us in these studies. And we hope that you will be able to join us for the next few weeks as we begin to draw out the details of what the hope of Israel is. Now that we see Israel's importance, how is it the hope of Israel and what is that hope made of?